Yo, what is going on everyone? My name is Nick, or The Notorious Fantasy, and in today's video, we're going to be going in depth into my week number 13, running back start or sit decisions for the 2023 fantasy football season, but before we can break down every single matchup from Thursday Night Football all the way up until Monday Night Football, I would like to ask that if you guys are new to the channel and you do end up enjoying today's video, that you please make sure to hit that subscribe button down below, and while you're down there, whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure that you leave a like on today's video it would help me out a ton if you want to follow me on twitter or x please do so at notorious fntsy and it is also important to note that we got a bunch of teams on by this week the buffalo bills the chicago bears the las vegas raiders the minnesota vikings the new york football giants and the baltimore ravens so without further I do. Let's get into my week number 13, running back start or sit decisions for the 2023 fantasy football season. We begin with Thursday night football, the Seattle Seahawks at the Dallas Cowboys. Now on paper, this matchup could be very fun. Maybe it ends up being a close game, but based upon how the Seattle Seahawks have looked recently and based upon the track record of the Seattle Seahawks from this season, there is a chance that the Seattle Seahawks get absolutely bent over a table here by the Dallas Cowboys. Cowboys. Speaking of the Dallas Cowboys, we'll start by discussing Tony Pollard. Now, Tony Pollard has been revived from the dead like his name was The Undertaker over the last two weeks. Prior to that, Tony Pollard owners across the whole entire universe were ready to jump ship. They were ready to abandon ship because Tony Pollard turned into a disaster. He starts the season off looking pretty solid, but then he fell into just a stretch of not being very valuable for fantasy. Now, he's such a talented player and he's on such a talented offense that it was truly hard to sit him, but he just wasn't producing. But like I said recently, he started to kind of flourish a lot more. He's had back-to-back -to -back top 12 games with a score in each of those games. It really does feel like Pollard is back to being the running back that I thought he was going to be entering into the season as well as a lot of other fantasy players. This week against a, in my opinion, overrated Seattle Seahawks defense, I will be firing up Tony Pollard with supreme confidence as a must-start running back this week. When it comes to the other Cowboys running back, Rico Dowdle, Dowdle did get a rare Thanksgiving gift as he did find Paydirt, scored a touchdown last week. But with that said, Dowdle is used late in games when the Cowboys are blowing the back out of their opponent. And even in those very positive game environments, has only been a top 18 running back twice this season. I think if you're a Tony Pollard owner and you're preparing for the playoffs and you got some guys on your bench that are probably never going to crack your lineup, you should probably go ahead and add Rico Dowdle as a bit of insurance, like the fucking Geico guy. But at the end of the day, while I think he's a great insurance piece, to me, while he's a nice handcuff, He's not a guy that I would risk starting for the Seattle Seahawks, likely going to be without Kenneth Walker, and that means that Zach Charbonnet is going to be the RB1. Last week, prior to the game up against the 49ers on Thanksgiving, I talked about how I was nervous about Zach Charbonnet because while I la 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 love the talent of Zach Charbonnet, the matchup was no bueno. And here against Dallas and Jerry's world, the matchup isn't necessarily terrible, but if the Seahawks offense comes out limp dick, just like they did last week, then Charbonnet is probably going to end up struggling to crack the top 20. Again, I love how talented Charbonnet is, but with the matchup being at least somewhat concerning and Geno Smith's play being straight up whack, Charbonnet is just a fringe start for me. DJ Dallas, while he does have a cool name, is a very clear start. Last week, even without Kenneth Walker, he saw just three touches. He is a clear stay away like he has. The cheese touch. Moving now to the Sunday slate, we begin with the Indianapolis Colts at the Le Titans, the Tennessee Titans. Jonathan Taylor has looked real solid over the last three games and looked amazing like Spider-Man last week against the Buccaneers, rushing 15 times for 91 yards and not one, but two touchdowns in that game. And with Zach Moss seemingly being mostly phased out of this Colts offense, JT becomes a must-start every single week with the upside to be the number one running back. Now, I get the narrative earlier on in the season was, oh my god, the Titans defense is a pass funnel, but they're elite. They're amazing against the run. 
Recently, that narrative has been thrown out. Even against the run, they're straight ass cheeks. So I think Jonathan Taylor should have quite the day this week. Zach Moss, like I said, he's been phased out. He saw eight carries last week for 55 yards and two receptions for 15 yards. And it feels like a decade ago at this point as to when Zach Moss was balling at this point in the season. Like I said, JT... They, like I said when I was talking about JT, sorry, they really stripped away, like the bottom bang and Sopranos, his workload. To me, he is going nowhere near my starting lineup. Now, if magically something was to happen to Jonathan Taylor, knock on wood, we don't root for injuries, then Zach Moss would be back in the good graces of fantasy football managers. But as of right now, Zach Moss is a clear sit and Jonathan Taylor is a must start. Derrick Henry ripped off a top 12 game last week against a bad Panthers run defense with 18 carries for 76 yards with one reception for zero yards and two total touchdowns. Now that game went about as great as it could go for Derrick Henry's game script. In order for Derrick Henry to be solid for fantasy football, the Titans need to be within striking distance of their opponent or winning the game, and then they're able to fully unleash Derrick Henry. But when the team is down and out for the count and they have to throw the ball a ton, Derrick Henry gets phased out for Tajay Spears. So assuming this game is able to be at least somewhat close, I think we could see a solid game out of Derrick Henry. But like I always say, if the game script goes in the opposite direction and the Titans are getting spit roasted, Derrick Henry could end up being a humongous bust this week for fantasy. If this game goes belly up with a decent amount of spears, we'll end up being utilized, right? We'll see a lot more spears. The problem is game script is hard to predict and the Colts as a whole to me are kind of like a wild card, right? Some weeks it's like, ooh, look at the Colts. Then other weeks it's like, oh, the Colts, right? Spears is ranked outside of the top 30 in six straight games. So while this game could definitely go his way in terms of the game script, even if it does, he isn't guaranteed to smash, so he is a sit for me. Next up, we move to a matchup between the LA Chargers at the New England Patriots. The Patriots are tanking with great success, as Borat would say, because now the Bears fucked around and won on Monday Night Football. In the worst game I've ever seen, and it's looking like, oh my gosh, the Patriots are going to get a new quarterback, Drake May, Caleb Williams, we shall see. But everything's going the way of the Patriots, of course. Austin Eckler, in all honesty, I am a huge Austin Eckler fan, but for a majority of this season, Eckler has not looked like himself. The terrible coaching decisions, mixed with the fact that Herbert looks sexually fucking frustrated, he's flustered all the time. It hasn't really helped him either. He has had two straight games ranked outside the top 28, which is a fucking anomaly compared to the straight cash, straight up free money that Austin Eckler has been over the last couple of years. The problem is we have seen the old Eckler at points this season. So I can't abandon ship, jump ship just yet, but I get why you'd be mad at Eckler, right? I am as well. But to me, against the Patriots, you still got to play him. For the other Charger, Joshua Kelly, he's just not good. I mean, there have been a lot of opportunities for Kelly this season when Eckler was hurt, and Kelly just goes into his fucking turtle shell. He can't get it up. He's straight up limp dick. Not even worth wasting too much time talking about him. Ramondre Stevenson has looked like his old self from last year recently, and that is very positive for his fantasy upside. This week, he faces a Chargers defense that isn't half bad against the run, and last week against the run, they looked really good. That Chargers defense fucking stood on their head against the Ravens, but Justin Herbert, the pervert, played not so bueno, no bueno, as they would say. I get that this offense sucks more cock than a $50 prostitute, but I still have to believe in Stevenson, who had nearly 100 rushing yards on 21 carries last week with five receptions for a grand total of, drum roll please, nine yards and a touchdown against the Giants last week, with back-to-back -back weeks having 20 or more carries. He should finish as a middle-of-the-road running back, too. Now, it definitely feels a little bit gross to play him due to the fact that the Patriots' offense is as incompetent, as much of a dumpster fire as it gets, but I'm still rocking with Ramondre Stevenson. 
I have said this over the last couple of weeks when it comes to Zeke, but Zeke looks legitimately decent. Now, I'm not going to get down on my knees and give him the Gawk Gawk 9000 special, but I will give him credit where credit is due. With that said, I still can't start him, though, due to how much usage that Ramondre Stevenson is getting. And again, you got to add on to the fact that, you know, it might be Mac Jones, might be Bailey Zappi. This offense is terrible. So outside of Ramondre and Demario Douglas, this offense is just, it's just sad. Next up, we move to the Detroit Lions at the New Orleans Saints. And speaking of sad, we got the Lions. Every single person in America expected the Lions to at least win by seven against the Packers. And instead, they get smacked up by the Packers on Thanksgiving. Crazy. Now... To break down this game going up against the Saints, Lions at Saints, ever since returning from injury coming out the bye week, David Montgomery has ripped off three straight games inside of the top 15. Now again, that offense, the Lions offense, looked like a bag of dicks last week on Thanksgiving, and honestly, that's putting things kindly. Jared Goff was a turnover machine. Montgomery still had 71 yards, though, and a touchdown. I expect the whole offense to bounce back here this week and Montgomery to flirt with being a top 10 running back. He isn't a necessarily must-start running back like a top 5, top 6, top 7, 8, 9, 10 type of guy, but he should at the very least finish inside the top 16, and I think he probably finishes inside the top 12. Jameer Gibbs fell off quicker than Ronda Rousey after going nuclear four weeks in a row. We were really banging the drum for Jameer Gibbs last week up against a very bad Packers defense, and he barely even cracked the top 24 at the running back position in that game. Now, I still believe very heavily in him, and he is still involved a shit ton in this offense, so Gibbs, just like like Monty should be at the very least, at the bare minimum, a top 16 running back up against a pretty eh, Saints defense against the run. When it comes to the Saints, all of the Saints wide receivers are hurt, and Olave could potentially miss this game as well. If that is the case, we probably see a healthy dose of Taysom Hill as well as the boy Alvin Kamara. With Derek Carr under center, I get, Nick, Derek Carr sucks. Let's throw fucking tomatoes through the screen at him, right? I get, everyone hates Derek Carr. I hate Derek Carr. I'm a Jameis Winston enjoyer. If you watched what I tweeted out a couple days ago, at or yesterday, at NotoriousFNTSY, Luda was performing at the game against the Falcons, and Jameis is going crazy rapping the lyrics, and Derek Carr is just sitting there like, motherfucker, man, I've thrown like a, I've been playing like shit this game, and all you're doing is singing some ludicrous lyrics, which was very, very funny, and I would love to watch Jameis play, but the one good thing about Derek Carr is that this man loves dumping the ball off. And I am not even being hyperbolic when I say that there is a legitimate chance that Alvin Kamara gets 20 targets this game. Now, 20 might be out of the ordinary, right? But I think it is really plausible. We've seen Kamara see as many as 14 targets in two different games this season. Kamara should be a lock to be a top eight back, especially since the Lions defense has done a straight-up 180. It's like, oh my god, look how great the Lions defense is against the Chiefs in week one. Ooh, look how good they're looking early on the season to getting absolutely bent over a table by Jordan Love Me Tender, Love Me Sweet on Thanksgiving. Jamal Williams now, I am a big fan of Jamal as he has a great personality, but sadly, you don't get fantasy points for being funny. His involvement is virtually zilch. Zero. There's a chance he gets zero fantasy points this week. So he shouldn't even be rostered. Next up, we move to the Atlanta Falcons at the New York Jumbo Jets. If you guys have enjoyed today's video thus far, please make sure that you hit that subscribe button down below. If you are new to the channel, and whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure they leave a like on today's video. It would help me out a ton. So the Atlanta Falcons at the New York Jumbo Jets in Gotham. Now the Jets... A couple of weeks ago, Jets fans were getting a little unruly, right? Jets fans were talking about how, talking about the playoffs, right? They're talking about how, oh my God, Rodgers is going to come back. We're going to make the fucking playoffs, right? And now that dream is dead. Brees Hall is the heartbeat of the Jets offense. The problem is the Jets offense is suffering from every other vital organ failing. This man had nine targets for seven receptions, 
and 24 yards against the Dolphins with seven carries for 25 yards on Black Friday. Regardless of which fucking scrub they decide to roll out there as the starting quarterback this week, I will be shaking. I will be nervous to start Brees Hall. But, and this is a big but, shout out Lisa Ann. With so many teams on by, I'll probably have to rank him inside of the top 18. Now, does it feel good? The answer would be, fuck no, baby. It feels disgusting. It doesn't feel safe by any means. I think he's going to be ranked that high because he'll probably see enough dump-offs to keep his head above water. Dalvin Cook might be one of the most disappointing players this season. While most people with eyes would acknowledge that he was falling off last season in Minnesota, he has completely lost it this season, averaging just 3.2 yards per carry and getting five or fewer touches in six straight games. He shouldn't even be on anyone's fantasy team. Now, B. John Robinson, B. John Robinson did something last week, and it was beautiful. Bijan looked like that. We talked about this with Tony Pollard. Bijan looked like the running back I expected him to be all summer long against the Saints. 16 rushes for 91 yards with three receptions for 32 yards and two total touchdowns. It appears that coming out the bye week that Arthur Smith learned that giving the ball to Bijan Robinson helps the Falcons win. I know. That was a very shocking conclusion to that dense bastard Arthur Smith, but for all of us fantasy owners, we already knew that. We already knew how good Arthur Smith was. Or not how good Arthur Smith was, because that guy's an idiot. How good Bijan is. And the Falcons and Arthur Smith should have known this because they drafted him so highly in the 2023 NFL Draft. Now, the Jets matchup on paper is rough, like sandpaper. But we have seen the Jets defense get bent over a table without the use of lube in back-to-back -back weeks by the run. So I'm not scared. Bijan is a must-start running back. And Mr. Arthur Smith, don't fuck us over here. Finally starting to feel confident. And that's where bad things happen, right? Tyler Algiers is sit while Bijan was taking the defense to pound town last week. Algier was... Still given 10 carries for 64 yards, and sadly for us Bijan owners, just like HIV, this bastard Algier will never go away. I still won't start him, but he's never fully disappearing. Next up, we move to the Arizona Cardinals at the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, I know what the first thing a lot of people are thinking right now. Nick, how can you sit James Conner? He's so good. And look, I'm a James Conner guy. I love James Conner. But since returning from injury in Week 10, Conner has yet to be a top 26 back with all of his performances being under 8 PPR points or less. This week, against a rock-solid Steelers defense, I think it's best to just avoid Conner. Now that I say that, he'll probably go crazy but I'm avoiding him this week. Michael Carter signed with the Cardinals and had four rushes for 19 yards and going four for four in the receiving game like he was at Wendy's for 15 yards. For me, Carter's a fun player. I think he has some skill to pay the bills, but ultimately with Connor there, Steelers defense, it's not like you're going to be starting Michael Carter, but he is the other running back to note, not Imari DiMarcado or Keontae Ingram, Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. Things are feeling good for Najee Harris. And again, I, I'm kind of shocked to say it because I didn't think Najee was going to have a great season. Things started off very bad, but with Matt Canada banished to Azkaban, Najee has had his most amount of rushing yards on the season by far last week. And he picked it through his most amount of passing yards. Brian Muth had his most amount of receiving yards. So Najee had 15 carries for 99 yards and a tug. Najee has looked much better ever since the team returned from the bye because, again, early on in the season, Najee Harris was abysmally bad, right? He'd get the ball. It looked like the fucker was running in quicksand. It looked like he was running in molasses, right? He was running at the speed that old people have intercourse, which is incredibly slow. So, that's great to hear for Najee. Against the Cardinals defense, while, again, there still appears to be a little bit of a stink on Najee Harris, I'm going to plug my nose and dive in for Najee Harris as someone that's in the running back two range. Jalen Warren felt a shot through the heart, and you're to blame, darling, you'll give love a bad name last week as he fell outside the top 32 at the running back position. Now, I won't call uncle. I'm not going to tap out on Warren just yet because this matchup gives me a little bit of a hard on underneath the table here. Pause. But at the end of the day, even with this great matchup, you know, a tremendous matchup, the greatest matchup, let me tell you, my Trump impression is bad, but 
the team commits more to Najee, Warren might start falling out of favor, so definitely would have Warren ranked below Najee this week. Moving next to a luxurious matchup. I mean, the matchups this week are just chef's kiss, Manu Fuique's exquisite. The Miami Dolphins, my Miami Dolphins, at the left, hands up, who are we? The Commanders! But before we break down this game at the running back position, as well as the rest of the games for week number 13, I would like to ask if you have enjoyed this far, please make sure to smash that like button like it owes you some money. Hit that subscribe button if you're new to the channel, and I would like to give you guys a quick word for our friends and our sponsor over at Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the best place to play NFL Pick'em, and Underdog has a great offer for you guys today, but first, I want to explain to you guys how Underdog Fantasy's Pick'em game works. Now, we're going to be talking about Thursday Night Football, the Seattle Seahawks at the Dallas Cowboys, and as of right now, as I'm recording this on Tuesday morning, Underdog hasn't put out all of their picks yet, so as the week goes on and we get closer to Thursday, there will be a lot more choices for you guys, but you have to pick a minimum of two players from at least two different teams. Sort of pick one player from the Seahawks and one from the Cowboys. We're going to go ahead and go with Jason Myers. Higher than one and a half field goals made. I think the Seahawks offense is going to struggle to move the ball, but I think they'll be able to get into field goal range a bunch, but maybe just not able to find pay dirt and score that touchdown. And then for the Cowboys, we are going to go ahead and go with Tony Pollard. Higher than half a rushing or receiving touchdown. It really feels like Tony Pollard's season is back on the train track. So we're going to go with Tony Pollard higher than half a rushing touchdown. Now, both of those hit. We'll get three times our entry fee. If we do three picks, it's six times. Four picks is 10 times. And five picks is 20 times our entry fee. Again, they all have to hit in order for you to get paid out. If you are new to Underdog Fantasy and live in one of the states on your screen right now, you receive a first match deposit bonus of up to $100 if you're new on there and use promo code Notorious. So if you deposit 100, you'll get additional 100. If you do 50, it's additional 50. 25, additional 20. The minimum deposit on Underdog Fantasy is $10. If you have a gambling problem, please make sure that you call 1-800-GAMBLER. Back on into things here, Dolphins at Commanders. We got Raheem the Wet Dream, and he went crazy against a stout Jets run defense last week in MetLife on Black Friday with 20 carries for 94 yards and two touchdowns. The Commanders defense is ripe for the taking, and I expect Mostert to... Finish as a top 12 running back yet again. This motherfucker averages 5.2 yards per carry on the season and is the running back too. Despite the fact that a lot of people seem to disrespect Raheem Mostert, he's been dominant 50 Shades of Grey style, even if Devin Two Chains returns this week, which is kind of an unknown at this point. I personally, as a Dolphins fan, think they're going to wait to bring him back, right? The Dolphins play the Commanders. And they play the Titans on Monday Night Football or Sunday Night Football, one of those. And then they play the Jets. So, like, no need to force A-Chain back. No need to rush him back. McDaniel kind of said A-Chain kind of implied A-Chain didn't play last week because of the matchup. And I think that'll probably be the case yet again. But again, who knows? Either way, though, I'm going to be the conductor of the Mostert Express, and this train has no brakes, baby. Choo-choo! All aboard, baby! Raheem Mostert, top 12 running back. Lock it in. Jeff Wilson Jr. in deeper leagues, I think Wilson would be a start. He looks solid against the Jets with 11 carries for 56 yards and 3 catches for 17 yards. He averages 4.7 yards per carry on the season, and again, assuming a chain is out, and sometimes making an assumption makes an ass out of you and me, but we're assuming that. Against the Commanders, he could easily score. Now, I definitely will be cautious with getting super ambitious and starting Wilson in a majority of leagues, but if your running back core is ran through, it's a little bit you know, no bueno, I would take a gander at Jeff Wilson. For the Commanders, Brian Robinson is just a fringe start. The Dolphins' defense has been tougher than the goddamn salty Splatoon recently, ever since Ramsey returned from the IR. B-Rob will still get fed like fucking President Taft, whose fat ass they had to make a whole new custom bathtub to be put in the White House for his ass. Now, again, while he's going to get a lot of carries, obviously, you assume you get fed like a fat guy, you're going to get a lot of carries, a lot of touches. Those carries will just be able to keep him into the start-worthy range. But with limited upside against the Dolphins' defense and a lowered floor, he is just a high-end running back three for me, which is a fringe start. 
Antonio Gibson returned from his absence in week 11, getting six carries for 21 yards and three receptions for 16 yards on Turkey Day against the Cowboys. Now, the Cowboys were feasting on that turkey from their pot, and uh, you know the Commanders were just feasting on a fucking big fat L because they got butt-fucked in that one. He does have decent upside, but against the Dolphins' defense, I just expect them to keep him in check. Next up, we move to the Denver Broncos at the Houston Texans, and if you told me in, like, week four or whatever the Dolphins just had their way with the Broncos, that the Broncos would look this good, that the Broncos could be a playoff team, I would say you're from a different universe, pal, because that doesn't line up. (laughs) But it is the same universe, and the Broncos are buzzing the Broncos are on fire Javante Williams despite seeing a hefty workload last week against the Browns Javante didn't have much to show for it this week the matchup is way softer obviously the Browns have a great defense the Texans defense is kind of average again I'm not saying that they suck ass but they're not amazing I do expect him to be a top 20 guy due to the volume and due to the fact that the Broncos offense looks a little bit better but I do still have some reservations when it comes to, like, Samaj P. Ryan's usage because it's been kind of up and down. But P. Ryan has been a top 18 running back in back-to-back weeks. And while I do believe that P. Ryan is a good enough player to command touches in this offense, the season as a whole would show you that this recent bump in touches will likely not be very stable. It is certainly possible that he finishes inside the top 18 again against the Texans defense. And if you're in a real deep league, like I definitely go with Jeff Wilson over him. But, you know, if you're really looking for some deep cuts like Samaje, there could be worse options. But for me, there's just a little bit too much risk involved to tout him as a start. Because, again, I don't think that those touches that he's been seeing are necessarily what he's going to see weekly. So Javante is a start. Uh, Samaje is going to be a sit. Devin Singletary only had six rushes last week for 18 yards against the Jags, but he made up for it with six receptions on seven targets for 54 yards. Singletary has been dropped like it's hot down my rankings since Pierce has returned, especially since we might see Damian Pierce get even further ramped up in terms of a workload this week. I still think that Singletary is a fine low-end running back too, but I'm nowhere near as excited as I was just a few weeks ago to play him with Pierce out of the picture. And speaking of Pierce, he's a sit. Now, Pierce returned last week, like we just said, and he was eased in, right? The just the tip technique. He got five rushes for 14 yards and one catch for four yards against the Jags. And even if they do ramp up his workload, based upon what we have seen this year, it's just a long list. It's a CVS receipt of being straight up ass. Nothing great out of Pierce this season. And again, I am a Pierce guy. I love Damian Pierce. I do. I think he's really talented. But even with the the Texans offense looking really, really, really mighty fine, I just can't do it with Damian Pierce. He just hasn't shown me anything. Next up, we got the Carolina Panthers at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Rashad White has been balling like Adrian Peterson in 2012 over the last six games. Nick, Rashad White is nowhere near as good as Adrian Peterson, you fucking cocksucker. I know. It's, you know, comparison. Not the same as Adrian Peterson. I get it. This week against a garbage Panthers defense, I expect him to keep up that sky-high level of play. If you've ever seen Sky High, the movie, it's fire. Gotta watch it. It's like a kid's movie, but I used to love that shit when I was a kid. White is a must-start back this week at home in Tampa Bay. Panthers defense, sleeping with the fishes. Rashad White looking magnifique. I know he had kind of a downer game last week, but he's still been really good. I got to ride with that. For Chase Edmonds, he's one of the few backs that will see work behind White. The guy just isn't very good and sees very little volume. Sit that guy down. Chuba Hubbard, I am very interested to see how interim head coach Chris Tabor handles the snap slip between Hubbard and Sanders. Now, obviously, interim head coach means that Frank Reich was fired. I think everyone kind of saw that coming. I talked about Frank Reich being on the scorching hot seat in the video yesterday morning. And then, like, after that video came out, I believe, like, an hour or two later, maybe just minutes later, Frank Reich was fired. If things operate as things did last week, Hubbard could be a sneaky good start. But if Sanders gets a bigger piece of the pie of this backfield, 
that Hubbard could be a colossal dud. This puts him in the fringe start range because we know that when given the opportunities, Hubbard does have top 12 upside. And against a Bucks defense that's been pretty so-so, I think that could be possible. He was a top 12 back against the Titans last week. But there is a lot of risks with the new coach here. So I kind of have to bump him down to that fringe start range to where, you know, I'd have to be really in a pickle. Like I'm Rick. Oh, that was such a shitty joke, you know. Really be in a pickle to start Chuba this week. Sanders did see 15 carries last week, but he did fuck all with it. He totaled a grand total of 28 yards. The man averages 3.1 yards per carry this season and absolutely robbed the Panthers for a hefty contract. Sanders can really play spoiler to a great game out of Hubbard, but ultimately I don't even think if Sanders gets the touches, like if this new interim coach is like a big Miles Sanders fan, like, give this bastard 25 carries. I don't even think he'd do much with it. That's how bad Sanders has been this season. Next up, we move to the Cleveland Browns at the Los Angeles Rams. Now, Kyron Williams returned from injury last week in Arizona and said, fuck your snap count restriction. Fuck your couch, baby. This man pounded the Cardinals defense into submission with 16 carries for 143 yards with six receptions for 61 yards and two touchdowns. It's like he never left, right? You remember early on in the season when Kyron Williams was single-handedly putting your team on his back, Darren Sharp for holding my dick, right? That's what he was doing. And then he gets hurt, but now he's back and again. It's like like nothing. He was never gone, right? He did No stab restriction, no nothing. The man was dominant like Shaq in the paint earlier on this season. And he did that yet again. Even while this matchup is a little bit spooky, a little bit scary against the Browns, I'm still going to dub Kyron a must start. Rolls Royce Freeman, despite the fact that Kyron was taking the reins like his name was Santa Claus, the Rolls Royce has no brakes apparently, just like that train we talked about a little bit earlier. The Mostert train, choo choo. Rolls Royce still finished as a top 18 back. Last week with 13 rushes for 77 yards and a touchdown. Against the Browns defense, though, I think you got to slow your roll here and throw Freeman back on the bench. Jerome Ford, F-150, played pretty mad last week against the Broncos, but I'll give the Broncos some credit. That's a defense that has, you know, kind of like the movie Get Hard. They've just gotten harder as the seasons went along. The offense got better. The defense has played better. Again, they are wildly different than that defense that we saw the Dolphins literally just like with their eyes closed score points right with that being said his day was saved by the receiving volume the biggest worry when it comes to Ford is not the matchup here but rather the quarterback situation in Cleveland is just very bad so Ford won't be given a lot of great opportunities to score right they're not gonna be in the red zone a ton thus limiting Jerome Ford's opportunities he has a lower end start on the week but he does possess a lot of upside due to his skill set and the Rams offense being pretty hit or miss weekly. Kyron, again, must start. Bang the drum for him. I'm screaming from the mountaintops about starting Kyron Williams. Jerome Ford just feels like a, ah, I got to start Ky- I gotta start Jerome Ford. Whereas Kyron, you're like, yes, I get to start Kyron Williams. Uh, when it comes to Kareem Hunt, three straight weeks ranked outside of the top 32 at running back. Well, at a point in the season from week 6 through 10, he scored at least one or more touchdowns in every single game. Ever since then, Ford has truly taken over. Like, he's been back, and all that touchdown upside disappeared. He will probably get 7 to 12 touches this week, right? Which is a lot for a backup running back. But with him being not very efficient at all, he's best left right in the pine. Next up, we got the best game of the week. The game prior to Sunday Night Football the San Francisco 49ers at the Philadelphia Eagles. I believe as of right now, the Eagles are underdogs, according to Vegas, which is very, very interesting. The Eagles, I know a lot of people are like, oh, the Eagles look like shit, but they keep winning. Well, there's something to that. They should have lost the Bills, and they came back, you know, coming on the back like Antonio Brown, if you know, you know. Christian McCaffrey, I get it. People are going to be scared. They're going to be like, oh, we got to bump... We got to bump CMC down the rankings because he's going against the Eagles front seven. Oh my God. My panties are on a bunch, right? Don't do that. 
Don't do that. All I really got to say is that this man could run for 180 yards and two touchdowns against the fucking 85 Bears. Five straight games inside the top six. Currently the running back one in the season. I won't waste any more of my breath. I won't. CMC is a must start every single fucking week. Elijah Mitchell with CMC healthy, unless this game ends up being like a dog walking of the Eagles via the 49ers, Mitchell will not see very much volume. McCaffrey is one of the few workhorse running backs still left in the league. He's like, Ang, the fucking last airbender, sit him down. DeAndre Swift, things were bleak for Swift last week against the Buffalo Bills as they got down by a lot and then they really couldn't run the ball as much. And when they tried to run the ball, it just didn't work. Like, oh my gosh, the Eagles have this great offensive line. Nothing was working. And then later in the game, they figured like, oh, here's the cheat code. Let's run it outside. And they could catch him outside. How about that? Because man, oh man, did that work. Things did get better, like I said, the second half. But ultimately, 14 carries for 80 yards just wasn't enough without a touchdown or much pass catching work because he only had one target to really cut it. This matchup does scare me against the 49ers, but Swift is at the very least, like worst case scenario, a high-end running back too. So you're starting him. You're starting him. I'm not going to get cute with a guy like McCaffrey and panic about the defense with a guy like Swift. You're starting both of them. McCaffrey, obviously a must start. Swift is not as much of a must start, but most teams are playing him. Kenneth Gainwell, every once in a blue moon, Gainwell will score. So with his touches being so far and few between, the odds of that actually occurring has never been lower. He is a sit every single week. Next up, we move to, Cause you waited all day for Sunday night. The Kansas City Chiefs at the Green Bay Packers in Lambeau. Speaking of the Chiefs, you know, I I don't want to say the Chiefs are like frauds. Oh my God, they beat the Raiders, Nick. You can't say that. You're a Dolphins fan. The Dolphins haven't beat a team over 500, you fucking idiot. The Chiefs just don't look the same, man. They don't. With that said, I'd be, as a Dolphins fan, like, I don't, I, I don't want to play him in the playoffs. I don't, I don't want to go into potentially Arrowhead and get, you know, leave with my head on a fucking spike, right? I'm scared of that. But right now, they, they don't look like that Chiefs team from the past. Just don't. Pacheco was scoring touchdowns like Derrick Henry last week. He had two touchdowns on 15 carries for 55 yards with five receptions on five targets for 34 yards, which is very much out of the normal for Pacheco. The team tried to use CH on the goal line, but that works about as well as just using a plastic bag as a parachute, right? That would not work at all. If McKinnon, now I've never heard someone use that. I just was like, oh, what's something that doesn't work well? And in my head, that's like the first thing that came to my head, fucking DB Cooper style, but he he used a real um, parachute. Even if McKinnon is back against the Packers run defense, that is not good. Pacheco is still a must start for me. Clyde Edwards Hilaire, like I said with Pacheco, CH got rejected at the goal line more than I did trying to hit on chicks in middle school. He flat out stinks to high heaven. I would be shocked if he finished inside of the top 50 at running back, even without McKinnon. That's it. When it comes to the Packers, AJ Dillon is a fringe start for me. He has been as unimpressive as it gets, but you know the volume's going to be there. If he somehow scores which he's only done once this season, Dylan will be fine. If not, he'll be probably close to the running back 28, which just barely makes him a start for me. Now, for me, I would have to be sent to Guantanamo Bay and be waterboarded. They would have to fucking blast the Nyan Cat song into my ears for 24 hours straight before I crack and throw AJ Dillon in my lineup because he stinks. But I can't label him as a sit since he should be just fine enough to barely be considered a start. Patrick Taylor Jr. saw just four touches last week, and even with how bad Dylan has looked, honestly, this Patrick Taylor fella looks worse. Final game here, Monday Night Football. Now, when the schedule came out, whenever it comes out, I don't remember. Before the summer, the schedule comes out, they have the schedule released, and it's like, ooh, Monday Night Football Week 13, Cincinnati Bengals, Jaguars. These could be two teams. You know, these are two playoff teams. These are two teams that could be contending for the AFC title if the Jaguars start playing real well. The Bengals keep up what they did last season. You know, Jags versus Bengals, at least in my opinion, entering into the season, that could have been a AFC championship game. Now we fast forward to present day and the Bengals are down bad with without Burrow and the Jaguars look like a serious team. With Jake Browning under center, the upside of Mixon has taken a Barry Bonds swing to the fucking dome. 
He should be fine against the Jaguars, but I don't really expect anything huge. So again, you start him knowing damn well the upside's low. He's probably not going to do terrible, but he's not going to be the reason why you win your week. Travion Williams last week, he saw a grand total of, you guessed it, zero touches. While to me it feels like he is the backup for Mixon, in best case scenario, he's getting like four touches, which just isn't roster worthy. For the Jags, just like Humpty Dumpty, ETN has taken a big fall. Funny, right? Uh, recently, as he hasn't scored more than 15 points in three straight games, and he was under 10 points in two out of three of those games. Quite the fall from grace, considering he was a locked and loaded top five running back from weeks five through eight. He is another guy that I'm not hitting the panic button on, though, as his volume has stayed relatively steady. He just needs to get into the end zone, and we'll forget that we were even slightly worried about ETN. He is a must-start this week against the Bungles defense. Dearness Johnson appears to have overtaken Tank Bigsby as the running back two on the team. He should see around eight touches this week, but with how good ETN has been and can be, Johnson is a must-sit. Thank you guys all so much for watching. If you didn't end up enjoying today's video, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button down below if you're new. Whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure you leave a like on today's video. It would help me out a ton if you want to follow me on Twitter or X. Please do so at NotoriousFNTSY. If you'd like to check out my weekly rankings as well as getting an answer to any of the questions you may have, make sure to check out the Patreon link in the video description for $7.50 a month. Love you guys all so much. Check out some of the videos that are on your screen right now. Wide receiver starts it video coming out a little bit later. I love you guys all from deep down the bottom of my heart. Have a great one. And as always, good boy.